Schindler in New York City. And uh, <laughs> the guy calls me back the next day and he goes, who are you? <laughs> I'm an educator, I say. <laughs> I saw his blog, he'll come and talk to educators for free. And he said, if he knows them personally. Oh, darn. And then he says, what's your budget? Oh, I say not very much. <laughs> it's like that. He goes, oh, he says, well, you know that everybody wants Malcolm Gladwell to come to the conference. And I said, oh, yeah, sure, I can understand that. He goes, you know he's 100,000. Oh, yeah. And then the guy tells me, why is Malcolm Gladwell? I'm going to start by putting on my Blue Jays cap briefly because <laughs> now, now you need to understand what this takes. Uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in a small town in eastern Ontario. I was born in Montreal, and I'm born and bred a Montreal Expos fan. <laughs> and I will never, ever surrender the faith. <laughs> but, you know, you have to move on. And finally, I saw my first ever Blue Jays game yesterday. So, so and, it, well, what, and what a game to watch, eh? Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the funniest thing. Uh, and, you know, it's actually, I've never, ever done a baseball theme for one of my talks. This is like talk number 244, I believe, plus or minus two. And I've never used a baseball theme before. I've had baseball pictures, but I've never themed the talk. I'm going to theme this talk a little bit on baseball. But, uh, you know, because I don't get into the big city a whole lot. You know, I live in Little Moncton, New Brunswick. <laughs> Population 140,000. Uh, we don't have the, uh, you know, uh, sky dome. We don't have a dome. We don't have, well, we do have sky. Uh, um, you know, we, we don't have uh, the subway, the transit system, the highway system. Even like your, your parking structures, I saw a number of your new parking structures are very impressive. They hold a lot of cars, but you have to tell me about the numbering system. I don't quite get it. 401, 407, QBW, I, I don't understand. 
but they do seem to hold a lot of cars. <laughs> so I, I saw them on my three hour trip here. Uh, baseball. Uh, you know, I, okay, I know some of you aren't fans of baseball, but I'm just going to use it as a bit of an analogy. I won't linger on it a whole lot. This basically is what I have in mind to talk about today. A little bit about simplicity and practice because I was watching baseball yesterday. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the work that I've done. I'm told that you guys all use Desire to Learn, uh, learning management system. I've been involved in development work with Desire to Learn, uh, doing some neat stuff. I can't talk a whole lot about that, but I can talk a little bit about that, and I'll talk a bit about my thinking in some of this development work. Uh, I want to talk briefly about the newsletter that I do uh, and, and how that works and, and what that's taught me, and I'll shade from that into some discussion about the personal learning environment project that I'm working on and the critical literacies course uh, that I've launched uh, along with Rita Kopp, also in Moncton, starting today. So that's how my day started, was fixing a problem with the server so that the critical literacies course would work properly. Uh, I got some stuff on how to learn using the internet, which I included because I sent an email earlier on today saying I was going to do it, so I should include it. Because that's the only part of this talk that was actually planned ahead of time. Uh, the rest of it wasn't planned ahead of time, but it's sort of, well, I'm talking to these guys, they do technology, they'll be interested in this, they'll be interested in this. Anyhow, so I, I kind of stacked on, on top of the prepared talk. So if we have time, I'll do the prepared bit of the talk. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's not going to bother me if we don't. And then end with simplicity and practice, and that's where, you know, I put on my sage hats. I, uh, so it was all so simple, really, no. But you know, uh, and I try to pull the baseball analogy in and tie it with a nice neat bow, which is what I always told my students. Uh, so that's kind of the plan. Um, ground rules, there are none. Uh, we are broadcasting live on the internet, so don't swear, please. Well, I swear if you want, I don't care. There's no FCC on the internet, but your bosses might object. Uh, but really, uh, there will be a record that will be used against you sometime, uh, so just so you know. Uh, I'm also recording on Audacity because I believe in making learning objects on the fly. Uh, this is what I've always done. Uh, I got into this business many, many years ago, too many years ago to count, working uh, at places like Assiniboine Community College uh, doing uh, uh, you know, education, technology development, learning management system, all of that, just when they're coming up with the concept of learning objects. So I've you know, talked about learning objects for many years. The original definition was all, I'm going way off topic already, but that's okay. Uh, very formal, very structured, and I've learned over the years that the best kind of learning object is the one you didn't plan for, that you just created on the fly out of what you're actually doing naturally. This is what I actually do naturally, and so I like to make learning objects out of it, hence the audio recording, hence the video recording on Ustream. Uh, last time I looked, we got 22 people watching us from around the world, as well as here. So it's always, with these talks, it's always 50-50 whether the internet audience will be bigger than the in-person audience. And that's always kind of fun, right? Because when that happens, my allegiance changes. <laughs> I'm no longer talking to you guys. And you'll see me start preening for the screen. <laughs> so, so that's the plan. The ground rules, like I say, uh, this talk is for you, not for me. Um, I'll have a lot of fun doing it. I always do. Uh, but, um, you know, if this doesn't work for you, if you want to pursue a different subject, um, you want to go with them, <laughs> that's fine. Um, you know, if you want to break out your cell phones and do whatever, that's fine. Uh, I don't mind that at all. Uh, you could uh, log on to whatever, Twitter, Facebook. There's no computers here. It's, it's very... Uh, well, I guess there isn't really going to be computers for an after-dinner toss. I suppose, anyhow. But whatever you want to do, that's fine. If you want to ask questions, make comments, hurl insults, 
whatever you want through the course of this. That's fine as well. I will happily go off topic and explore something in more depth if that is of interest to you. And uh, so do feel free to, to sway this in whatever direction you want it to go. So how does that sound for a start? All right. Some people actually said great. I'm not used to that. How is Paul? You're a small but friendly audience. <laughs> Proving it. And the people on the internet don't get a say. Because I can't see it. All I can see on the internet is my screen. Okay. So, here's my baseball analogy. I actually got to see Scott Downs pitch, too. Which is, <laughs> threw one pitch. I was lucky enough to take a picture. He threw one pitch, and the guy hit it into the corner for a triple. <laughs> And that was it. That was his game. <laughs> how, how would you like to have that as your day? Or how was your day at work? I threw one pitch and it was a triple. <laughs> and the run came in too, so it's going to be scored against them. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, baseball, and if you don't like baseball, it's fine. Just substitute your own analogy. Put in your own word for baseball, because this will work for pretty much anything. It's a very simple sport. It's a very simple game. And, you know, you've, you've heard the saying, right? You, you throw the ball, you catch the ball, you hit the ball. That's baseball. But what intrigues me about baseball, and also about darts and photography and other things, you take these very simple elements and you mix them up, and it's something new each time. That's what I love about baseball. You, go, you never know what's going to happen. People in Philadelphia last week sat down. Just another ball game. Roy Halladay's pitching. What do you know? Perfect game, right? Who can see that coming? You, you can't. But the idea here is that the elements of baseball, the elements of anything, are very often very simple. You guys do programming, right? What is programming, right? Uh, you read the variable, you write the variable, you print the variable. Okay, there's a bit more than that. You have an if-then and a loop. Okay. There's not much more than that. Everything else is a combination of these simple elements. And that turns out to be true in a lot of our endeavors. And it especially turns out to be true, in my mind, in the field of instructional technology. You know, part of the talk that they wanted me to do, and I'll, I'll do a little bit of it, is to talk about learning management systems and things like that. But in the end, doing learning technology boils down to very simple things, very simple technologies. Uh, and, and they look complicated and they act complicated, but at the core, they are not complicated. And it's getting at that core which really makes it possible to work with these things. But that having said that, the other side, and this is the learning side of things, it's a simple game. You throw the ball, you catch the ball, you hit the ball, but you have to do it 10,000 times to get good at it. Now, this is what I learned playing darts, right? How hard is it to throw a dart at a wall? Anyone can do it. I've only seen two or three people actually miss the wall in all the time. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's remarkable when they do. Right? Oh, yeah, you hit the ceiling. <laughs> anyway, it's funny because you, you go to play darts, and there are these little holes in the ceiling. Right? You think, how could they do that and miss it? But, you know, it's really easy to throw the dart. That's it. This, this is throwing darts. That's it. But you have to do it 10,000 times, and maybe you'll be good if you're lucky. Well, no, you, you will be good, but that's the way it works. It's so simple. You throw the dart, you go pick up the dart. That's why they have three. Anyhow. <laughs> If it was only one dart that you threw at a time, I'd be 50 pounds lighter. <laughs> so, <clears throat> let me talk briefly. I'm not, not going to talk a long time about this. Synergique is a project that I've been involved in with the National Research Council, uh, with Desire to Learn, and with the University of Moncton. University of Moncton, they're based in Moncton, small French-speaking university. Uh, they use Desire to Learn, our primary client, Desire to Learn. Very involved in it. Desire to Learn, of course, is Desire to Learn. And then there's us. 
what Synergy is, what Synergy is, it's a French name, I have trouble with it all the time, uh, is, a, uh, is a project to automate content production on a learning management system, and, the, and specifically the <laughs> desire to learn learning management system. There's all kinds of things involved in content creation. What we're trying to do is get at this, and, and the experience, my experience with this has been pulling ourselves out of the complexity that is a learning management system and, and trying to refine content creation into something relatively simple and then put that back into the learning management system. And it's tricky when you're working in an institutional setting. And I don't do institutional settings very well, as you can probably imagine. But it's tricky because, uh, you know, unlike the early days of online course creation, you don't have some lone wolf professor out there making content anymore. You have content design teams. And so you've got all kinds of coordination issues uh, and, and communication issues and just structure and process issues that you need to attend to when you're creating content as a collaborative team in an environment like Desire to Learn. And so it's important not just to set up this great content creation system. The world is full of great content creation systems. Uh, you know, all that Flash stuff or Dreamweaver and all the great content creation system. Less great when you've got a team of 15 people trying to use the same application. So we see that we're working in this environment and we, and we see that the real issue with content creation here isn't so much the content creation, it's the coordination, the communication, and the collaboration. You know, and it's again, it's the talking to each other is the simple things is a simple thing. Talking to each other in this kind of context is a bit more difficult, but if we focus on the simple, it lets us do the difficult. So, this is one of the outcomes, and, and just let, let me explain my role briefly in the project as well. Um, how, do, how do I... Uh, I uh, basically, my role has been to direct the research in the project. So we've got a technology development team, a product development team, there are the marketing people on that. And then on my side is the research and and, yeah, and and development. So this is basically the first thing that came out of the project. Uh, this was released by Desire to Learn not too long ago, but three or four weeks ago. And basically it's a troll box uh, so that you can build <coughs> create objects, browse objects, and the idea is to allow people working in the environment to basically build the courses using a drag and drop kind of interface. So much better than populating drop down lists. Uh, hands up, all of you who are sick of drop down lists. Uh, so the, the main thing here was to try to get it so that you can see it very modularly, very visually, and, and so that you can just get the object that was created here, drag the object that was created there. Now, there's more to this behind the scenes. This, you know, again, I don't want to say it like this, but anybody can do a wizard. Anybody can create a wizard. I mean, if Microsoft can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> but the, the trick is to have a wizard that is kind of smart, right? So behind the scenes, what you want to do is to be able to identify the different elements that are in the system and have these elements inform the wizard of what it wants to do. We broke that down into four major areas. And I know I can talk about this because it's on the website. But they're really picky about what you can talk about and what you can't talk about. If it's on the website, it's fair game. So if anybody wonders, this was on the website, so don't complain, Rose. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, um, these are the four areas of research that we focus on. Uh, distributed digital rights management, automated metadata extraction, learning design accelerators, and weak workflows. So this is neat stuff, if you ask me. 
Um, and, and just as an aside, I'm not a D2L person. I'm not selling D2L or anything like that. And this is just the first part of the talk because I think you might be interested. <coughs> so if you're not, let me know. But you look interested. So, and you on the web, you'll just have to. I figure we're up to about 30, 35 now. So I'm, not, I'm wavering, right? <laughs> Uh, distributed digital rights management is something that I came up with, and, and I say I because I came up with it. Uh, back when I was working on a project called EduSource. I don't know if you guys remember EduSource. It was a national consortium, mostly of universities, but also with a few companies involved, to create a Canada-wide repository of learning objects. Never really took off because they wanted to make it all closed and private. I was the only one in there saying, no, 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 open it up, open it up, let anybody contribute. No, we have content providers. Anyhow, what I wanted to do with EduSource, and which I never really did get them to accept, which is too bad, but what I wanted to do is set up a system whereby you could have a marketplace of learning resources. We'll just wait for it. Sound effects. <laughs> yeah, <there he> is. <laughs> That's okay. I love the the equipment cart here too. It's, it's better this way. You know, when there's no podium, people don't expect a lot, and that's when I'm at my best. <laughs> So yeah, the idea was, right, and the idea, the, the main idea, like, my, okay, I'm kind of sneaky. The main idea for me was to set up some kind of marketplace where you can have free content made by anybody sitting there alongside the content created by publishers. That has always mattered to me. And it's, it's mattered for a variety of reasons. One reason is free content is cheaper, obviously. But the other reason, we'll come back to this is, uh, we'll come back to this, the other reason is that the creation of free content is as important an educational activity as the consumption of free content. In fact, more important. It's more important to create than it is to consume. That's where the learning happens, is when you're creating. And that's always been an underlying belief of mine. So if we have a system where the free content can come into the same marketplace as the commercially produced publishing house special content, then we have an environment where people can stack up what they've done against the professional content and see how it measures up. And surprisingly, in my experience, is it'll measure up pretty well a lot of the time. Not always. Publishers produce pretty good content. But a lot of time, people will surprise you. You know, it's like Brandon, Brandon Morrow. 6.6 .6 ERA coming into yesterday's game. That means, on average, if he goes out to pitch, they're going to score seven runs on him. Goes in and pitches a three-hit jam of a game. Who would have expected it? Nobody. But there you go. You don't know. Sometimes the unexpected happens. Anyhow. So DDRM is a mechanism whereby you don't attach the rights associated with an object to the object. Rather, you associate the rights, you, you put the rights associated with an object into a repository and then put in the object a pointer to that repository. And that way, you can point either to one of the Creative Commons free licenses or to any commercial license that you want. And you can change that license up on the fly. And the idea here is that you don't have just one of these rights repositories. You have many of them all over the place. You can set up your own rights repository if you want. So that way, everybody becomes their own rights broker. You don't need to depend on some centralized rights broker. It makes everybody a publisher as well as a consumer. That's what I wanted to do. Well, you can see how, you can imagine how well that went over with a national consortium of universities and publishers. So, <laughs> but. I've never abandoned that, and that has formed the background of some of the work that I've done with the Synergique project 
and one of the outputs of that is the Creative Commons licensing that you can do in Desire to Learn Now. I mean, that's already enabled. So I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, automated metadata extraction is a pretty easy one. Uh, well, easy in concept. For those of you who are familiar with learning object metadata, here's the principle. You have a learning object. You want this learning object to be discoverable. So how do you make it discoverable? Well, what you do is you describe the learning object with metadata. So there's an international consortium called IMS. Tell me if you've heard this, right? Uh, an international consortium called IMS comes up with the IMS learning object metadata specification, which later becomes IEEE LOM, learning object metadata, which later becomes SCORM, shareable courseware object reference model. And basically, again, it's your 87 fields that describe the learning object. Well, people did studies, Norm Friesen among them, found that most people didn't use all of these fields. Most people used about five of them. And as a result, this wasn't really a very useful system. Now, these fields are still kind of useful. You know, knowing what the subject of a learning resource is will make it easier to discover, for example. But what you want to do is not to have people fill out 87 fields. There are, well, again, publishers, but there are publishers there with a million objects. Can you imagine having somebody sit there filling out metadata fields for a million objects? You know, how do you get yourself up for going to work in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well today I'm going to do objects number 100,423 to 25. <laughs> um, so this part of the project is automated metadata extraction. The idea is when you input a resource into the repository, the repository goes boop and analyze, it really does that. I'm not making that up, it makes that noise. <laughs> Just kidding analyzes the learning resource and figures out what it is. That's not implemented yet, but that's part of the project that we're working on. And we know how to do it. There, there's lots of different ways of doing it. And what we're up to now is optimizing it, finding the best way to do it. Learning accelerators, learning design accelerators, you've already seen some of the work. Uh, well, if you've seen on the previous screen, you've seen some of the work that's come out of that. And again, it's a tree. <laughs> that would be a uh, what? A fake tree accelerator. <laughs> okay, well that was different. <laughs> you never know what to expect. That's a, it's the way I love doing these talks. You never know what to expect. Um, so the learning learning design accelerator again is the idea of the wizard. Is the idea of the collaborative environment where multiple people can work together to produce a learning resource. Finally, the idea of group workflow. <coughs> Excuse me. This relates directly to the theme that I am working a theme, not particularly successfully, but it's there, uh, of, of simplicity. I want you to think, think, think about Oh, I love this place. This is a great room. Um, think, think about the process, well, any process really, but the process of making learning resources just for fun, okay? And visualize it in your mind. Picture yourself sitting down at the desk uh, and you're, you're gonna make some learning resource and, What's going to be involved in that? And imagine there's someone new in the office, and you're going to tell them or show them how to go about doing this. Well, what are the mechanisms? What are you going to tell this kind of person? Um, there are different ways of approaching this. And this is a problem that we have in general. This is not just a problem that we have when we're talking about how to build learning resources. It's a problem we have in general. And so, here it is. The new person's here. He's sitting down. Oh, 
first you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. And if you're the typical sort of person describing how to use, say, Flash or, or uh, Dreamweaver or any of these other things, you, you've probably seen, well, first you do this, then click here, then click here, then click here, click here, click here, and so on. It's like giving somebody directions, right? Uh, how do you get to Humber College from Skydome? Problem I had to solve today. Uh, well, you know, first you take this road, then you take this road, then you take this road, then you take this road, and then you take this road. And it's a fairly long distance. There's actually a series of about 43 steps that you have to take. Each step taking approximately 12 minutes, which is why it results in, you know. Right? Sounds kind of familiar, right? But that's not really a very efficient way of explaining how something works because what you've done is you've shown them how to do one thing. So what you want to do is you want to back it up a step and try to simplify it. See how I'm working that thing? Right? And the first step in the way of simplifying things is instead of it's like central station in here. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's, it's, it's funny. It's probably the same guy. <laughs> no, it's a different guy. Um, so the first step is, well, instead of just giving somebody step-by-step-by-step -step -step procedures, a proceduralist approach, give them some rules. And the reason why you give them some rules is because once a person has a rule-based kind of approach, you can be a lot more flexible than if you're working with a proceduralist approach. Now, we're approaching the limit of what I can talk about with respect to this particular product. But think for yourself right now, because remember now we're working about, we're talking about how we're gonna build a piece of software called Desire to Learn, which is a computer program. And I assume most of you guys have had your arms into programming. Uh, if you're gonna move away from proceduralist approaches to programming, and you think rule-based approaches might be more efficient, how would you design piece of software like Desire to Learn. So that's what we're doing. Uh, in, in the background of this, we're trying to simplify in our minds the sorts of things that you need to take into account when doing this sort of thing, like creating learning resources, and then create what's called a weak workflow system in order to implement that in software. Uh, you might wonder where, what the week is in week workflow. I'm going way off topic, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. But anyhow, uh, the week in workflow is this. Workflow is, it takes you through according to the predefined set of rules. Week workflow is, you can change those rules on the fly as circumstances change. It's not a fixed set of rules. It's an adaptive set of rules. So being able to come up with your rules, work with your rules, and adapt your rules is generally more efficient than taking a proceduralist approach to things. Now, on the end, on the other side of things, it just looks like you know, this pretty smart piece of software that actually knows who you are and remembers what you've been doing. But behind the scenes, it's moving from proceduralist to something better. Now, for those of you who have studied artificial intelligence, what I've just been talking about won't be too unfamiliar. And there's the next bit of the of the of the piece let's try that sentence again and there's the next penny to drop you see i was trying to work penny to drop into the other sentence and it wasn't working 
language is so interesting. Anyhow, uh, language is like baseball because really, it's very simple, right? You have, you have throw the word, you catch the word, you hit the word, you string the words together, you together the word string. Well, okay, it's not that simple, but it's still pretty simple. And yet, we can still do it wrong. <laughs> it's like the darts in the ceiling. Um, so, the proceduralist approach, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Okay? That's kind of like learning the 18th century. Then there's the rule-based approach. It's almost like the Ten Commandments approach. You know, you, you should do this in such and such a case. You should do this in such and such a case. That's kind of like traditional AI, right? It's the basis behind expert systems. It's the basis behind Lisp and things like that. That's maybe the 20th century approach, late 20th century. 21st century approach is what comes after expert systems, which in the world of computing science is connectionist systems and neural networks. And that's kind of like taking the whole concept of rules and simplifying them. But let me leave that there. Let's see what's on the next slide. Oh, yes. Okay. Let me leave that point hanging expectantly. And I'll move on to the next bit of the talk. So uh, when I was introduced, uh, one of the things that was talked about was that I produced this daily newsletter called OL Daily. And there it is. And what OL Daily is, OL Daily is actually my bookmarks on steroids, really and truly. Um, there goes the cauliflower. <laughs> I'm sorry. Where else would you have a tray of cauliflower? Go buy it. <laughs> It just, it's funny. <laughs> uh, back in, you know, 1995, 1996, uh, you know, like a lot of you, I'm sure I was getting onto the web using Netscape, just not the asparagus, please. <laughs> <laughs> and I started keeping track of the good websites and the resources with my bookmarks, and which worked really well, but you know, once you get to like a thousand, two thousand bookmarks, it gets too cumbersome. I try, and also too, you know, the bookmarks at home, the bookmarks at work, they don't match. So what do you do? You put your bookmarks on your website, and that's good. But then you have a page that takes twenty minutes to load, so that's not working so well. So back then, what I did. I did what anyone would do. I built my own content management system. And so I started just recording, you know, I built a little database. You, may, you might know, why didn't I just use a database? Well, because it was one of these ISP accounts and I had access to nothing. I had access to a basic Perl interpreter and that's it. No Perl modules, no built-in databases, no nothing. And even if I did have a built-in database, I had no clue how databases work, so I built one. And uh, actually it worked pretty well. I used it for quite a number of years. And basically set up a little system so that I, I just had a little form. I could input my bookmarks into the little form, hit submit. It would store them in my little hand-built database. And then I had another page that would display them and give me access to search through them and lo and behold, my bookmarks on my website. And I felt so proud of myself. Now, a few years later, people like uh, Mesh Nishani uh, in uh, Singapore and uh, another guy you might have heard of called Elliot Macy and some others were doing these newsletters, email newsletters. And I thought, wouldn't it be neat if I took my little database system and made it into an email newsletter? So that's what I did. I just took the output of that sent it to SendMail, SendMail sends it off to a subscription list, and away you go, OL Daily is born. And I did that, started that uh, email newsletter thing in May of 2001, and I've been doing it pretty consistently ever since then. So 
I've developed kind of system over the years. Um, this is this is my Google Reader uh, screen, just because it, it's fun. I, that's I spend a lot of time, a couple hours anyways, every day, uh, in front of my Google Reader screen. Screen. Uh, I read oh I don't know a few hundred uh, edu bloggers and magazines and various other sites dedicated to educational technology and I scan those and I scan my email and I scan various Google alerts and other sources all of this is part of the canned part of the talk later on so if I get to that that's what this is about um, so I do all of that and then I write up my links I've become the master of the 100 word essay and uh, put together seven or eight of those every day and I send them out. Over the years I've done 700 or sorry 17,000 of these posts. And when you do 17,000 of anything you learn some things. Um, one thing you learn is how to count to 17,000. It's not easy but it can be done. Um, and, you, know, you start with your never mind. Uh, I was going to say the journey of 17 uh, so, what does 17,000 posts look like? It, it looks like, well, it quite literally looks like that. Over the years, because and this is one of the real joys of rolling your own software, you can make it do whatever you want. You don't have to just sit there and wait. Take that, Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> you just sit there and make it do whatever you want, right? So, my software would take in these links, find connections between them, it automatically uh, checks the content and assigns a topic to it. I don't tag, my system tags for me. Uh, all kinds of things. Uh, it looks at who links to who and it creates when it's working. It's not always working, that's the weak part. The weakness of rolling your own software is a lot of the time it's broken. Uh, but it looks like that. It looks quite literally like chaos. It looks quite literally like this great big mass of interconnected stuff that makes no sense at all. Uh, it's quite literally complex. And this is important for the purposes of our talk because there's a distinction to be drawn between the concepts of complicated and complex. And that's why it's kind of Kind of interesting uh, human cloud with this gaping void. I love his little cartoons, although I'm not so keen on his politics. But he draws this wonderfully complex diagram and then says it's complicated. So I appreciated the irony of that. Here's what here's the distinction. Complicated means it's made up of a whole bunch of individual parts, atoms or molecules or whatever, Legos. That's what, that's what they thought learning objects would be, right? The, the Lego picture or the atom picture. You take this resource and this resource and this resource. And you just put them all together like a big jigsaw puzzle. Even the Synergique logo, if you remember a few screens back, has these jigsaw puzzle pieces, right? That's complicated. Complicated things, brick houses, bridges, apparently not oil rigs, but complicated things can be understood with rules. Ah, oh, tied together, oh yes. Right? You can deal with complicated things with rules because the thing with complicated things is although there's a lot of pieces, if you understand the pieces, you can understand the system. The philosopher in me now wants to go off on a digression about Rene Descartes and the analytic method, but I won't won't do that. Complex, though, is a different story entirely. Do I have a slide? Yeah, okay. In a complex system, it's like a complicated system. You have many different parts, but in a complex system, these parts affect each other. They are, as, as I like to say, as a lot of people like to say, not just me, connected. And that results in, quite literally, chaos. That's the old butterfly principle, which you've probably all heard. 
ad nauseum. And yeah, I'm going to throw it at you because, well, it's on the slide. You know, the butterfly in South America, which was really neat being in Argentina giving this, right? Because I was mean, that butterfly. Right? The butterfly in South America can affect the weather in Central Park. So presumably, right, if it was just a complicated system, we could go look at the butterfly and make a prediction. But it doesn't work like that because, and this is what this neat little diagram signifies, the same initial conditions, but in a complex system, you get divergent results. It's like a baseball game. Same initial conditions. One day he throws a game, seven runs against, or 14 runs against sometimes. Another time he throws a three-hitter. Who can predict it? Yeah, there's a range of possibilities. Nobody's going to go out there and get 800 runs scored on them. It's not going to happen. So there's a range. But within that range, you can't predict it. So you can't just use rules to understand the system. You can't manage your content with a rule-based network. So this is the stuff desire to learn isn't doing yet, so I get to talk about it again. So the three-body problem is probably the paradigm example, and if you follow those links, you'll get neat little animations of the three-body problem. Basically, if you have three bodies in space, how will they orbit each other? That's the question. You think, oh, three bodies. How could you go wrong with three bodies? But the thing is, the gravity of one body affects the gravity of the other body, right? Or affects the movement of the other body. So they start rotating around. The, if you start them off the same way, they still... Try that again. If you start them off the same way every time and play the simulation... The simulation comes out different every time because of minor variations in how the three bodies affect each other. It turns out to be basically impossible to predict how three bodies will orbit around each other just because of the way they impact each other. So, my thinking on how to organize learning resources how to organize learning, how to think about learning, is based on going from a system where we think of all of this as described by rules to a system where we think of all this as described by however it is that a network operates. And luckily for me, I have access to a network called the internet, which is, in my mind, absolutely the greatest learning management system that has ever been produced. Even better than Desire to Learn. And much better than Blackboard. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do we even think about learning in this sort of environment? How do we manage learning? How do we approach learning? And the approach I try to take with people Especially when I'm talking to educators, you notice how I'm moving closer to the camera, so I'm filling the screen. Now that's for effect in the video. <laughs> I figure I'm up to about 45 or so, unless I'm losing them. Uh, where was I? <laughs> it's really bad when you're me and giving a talk and you run off and get onto a digression and then you forget where you were. Uh, Internet. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's the whole theme of the talk. <laughs> what I like, because, see, if I were Malcolm Gladwell, say, to pick a name out of the air, I'd come and I'd probably tell you how to teach people. Certainly, if I'm Mark Prensky, probably cheaper, but not as cheap as me. <laughs> That's what I do. But really, to me, it's more important to talk about how to learn. And the, the focus, especially the, the packaged part of the talk, and hence the title, is about how to learn. 
I want to talk to teachers about how teachers do their own learning. Student, forget about the students. Students will be fine. Okay, maybe they won't, but forget about them. I'm more interested in how teachers learn themselves, how educators learn themselves, because, you know, they, they can't spend all day in a classroom, and even if they could, who'd want to? So, and, and you know, educators need to be almost model learners. So, thinking about how best to learn as an educator, you know, it plays multiple roles. But really, I want the talk that I give to be of immediate practical use to people. And what's of immediate practical use isn't, you know, how you go back to your job and teach people. It's how do you learn? How do you develop your own capacities and get a better job and make more money? Or do the things that you want to do? Or, you know, uh, win the World Series? Okay. I guess the World Series isn't in any of our futures, is it? Uh, yeah. Well, there's some pretty young people here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, over the years, I, along with a guy you might have heard of called George Siemens, have come up with a theory of learning based on these network principles, and these connectionist principles, called connectivism. George's name. He came up with the name. Blame him. Uh, but, but the theory belongs to both of us, although uh, if you ever actually looked at what we write, we have different flavors and the same kind of thing. My theory is a bit better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> different, I mean different uh, than his. So, the idea of a connectivist course, again, Think of, think of it from the perspective, right? We're going away from proceduralist, away from rules, away from that kind of cognitivist, content-based kind of approach to this network kind of way of dealing with the world. So there's no curriculum, no theory, no body of knowledge that we expect the students to absorb and learn how different from what is currently the case in many cases, right? That doesn't mean there's no content. What it means is the content is what they call the MacGuffin. You ever heard of the MacGuffin? The MacGuffin is a device, who came up with it? Ellery Queen? Robert Heinlein? I forget who. That the story is about. The Maltese Falcon, in the Maltese Falcon, the Falcon is the MacGuffin. Now, when you read the book, The Maltese Falcon, you don't really care about the Falcon. You care about the characters and how they interact and who's going to live and who's going to die and what motivates them. The Falcon is just the thing that everything that revolves around that makes the story possible. Raiders of the Lost Ark. The Lost Ark is the MacGuffin. Really, when they get to the Ark, Weren't you disappointed, really? Right? But it doesn't matter, right? Uh, Star Wars. The MacGuffin is the Death Star, right? Or maybe the MacGuffin is the Force. It doesn't matter, right? It's just this, this thing that everything else revolves around. That's what content in a connectivist course is like. Yeah, sure. We'll study algebra. We'll study geography. We'll study whatever. But that's the MacGuffin. Right? That's the thing that we're working with, but more, what we're really interested in is how all the people, all the knowledge, all the characters, all the drama, the mystery revolves around that. It's a thing, it's a catalyst. It makes all the rest of it possible. So, George and I set up a connectivist course. We used my software, which at the time was working, and actually had a name, by this time it had the name Grasshopper, which I thought was an incredibly clever name because if I dropped the A in Grasshopper, it was G-R-S-S, -S, Hopper. And R-S-S is a major technology underlying. And of course, Grasshopper, learning, you know, it all kind of goes together. So, just love the name. I feel sort of disappointed I have to 
move on from that name and my other projects, but I, but still, Grasshopper is mine. It'll always be mine, and it's open source and available, and sometimes it even works. So we set up this course, and we set it up as a connectivist course, which means there's no content, or actually, because, because I program, I thought it would be fun if we did it recursively. So the content of the course is the course. Um, so if you want to learn about the course, you take the course, and when you're in the course, you study the course. And, right. That worked out actually remarkably well, much better than it should have. Uh, so we set up the course. It's an open online course, and once we launched it, it became a massive open online course, or a MOOC, because we had 2,200 people sign up for the course. And so my software got its first robustness test, uh, which it passed. And all that effort caching, I spent, I spent you, you have no idea how many hours I built making things cache, and it all paid off, and it all worked. <laughs> um, but the idea is, how, how do you manage a massive open online course with 2,200 people, you might ask? Uh, well, you don't. Uh, you don't put them in one place. You don't tell them what to do. You don't give them assigned readings. You don't do any of that stuff because even if you wanted to, you couldn't, which is wonderful because we didn't want to. So what we did, the, the idea of one of these color, uh, massive open online courses is, although we'll provide some basic infrastructure, you know, the Grasshopper content system, we provided a Moodle, we had a blog, we had a wiki, we had a Twitter tag, and so on. But we told people in the course, yeah, you, you can come and use these things, but what we really want you to do is create your own environment for the course. Don't come, don't come into our system. We probably can't support it anyways. Use your own system. Use your own blog. Create some Google groups or Yahoo groups, preferably Yahoo groups, because I just hate the interface in Google groups. Just an aside. Um, who's with me there? Yeah. Uh, we had three separate Spanish language groups spring up, one of which was in Second Life. It was the Connectivitas, which I thought was great. Uh, we, we had um, a Ning, back when Ning was free. Uh, they set up a Ning around the course. That still exists. Uh, a whole bunch of things. There were, there were people made videos, people made concept maps. And what Grasshopper did, because by now, Grasshopper isn't just a place where I put my bookmarks and where I distribute my newsletter. Grasshopper now is also a fully functional RSS aggregator because, well, it's better that way. And so what Grasshopper did is aggregate the content from all out there, all over the internet, bring it together, all the stuff to do with connectivism that was tagged, CCK08, and uh, tell me my fly isn't down. Okay, good. Is this your laughing? And when people are laughing, the speaker, first, I'll, I'll guarantee you, and I know you know this, first thing, right? And no, but it's okay, so I'm good. <laughs> uh, where was I? Oh yes, CCK08, aggregate, aggregate CCK08, CCK08, puts it in the newsletter, sends it out to 2,200 people. Well, actually, 1,870 people, that was the subscription base to the newsletter. Uh, students in the course built 170 separate web blogs. That, that's how many RSS feeds I was aggregating. Who knows how many Twitter accounts were being used, so it was at least one Flickr account. Uh, several, as I said, second life sessions and Spanish translations and so on. Uh, it was ridiculous and it worked. We ran it again the following year and this, is, this was my first really big surprise. The people who took it in 2008, a lot of them came back in 2009. Okay, well that's pretty good, but then they started teaching it. And I realized that in the space of one year, I had basically become redundant in my own course. <laughs> and, but, but it struck me that this is actually a success indicator. 
right? When they come back and then start working with the same content, whatever that content was, that they came up with in the previous year. So, taking the idea of grasshopper, I always want to say it with an accent, uh, and the connectivist course, uh, my other project that I'm working on at NRC, which is not Synergic, it's Son of Synergic, or Synergic but better, uh, is called Plurn, and not P Learn. <laughs> Those two lines indicate that this is one syllable, and that's the phonetic pronunciation. Plurn. And people who use it are plurners. We're not only good at technology, we're good at names. Nobody came up with the plurn. I can't believe it. It's just, it's so obvious. After. Right? So, hey, you can see the slogan now, right? Earn with plurn. That's not my calling, is it? Uh, personal learning environment. Now, oh, I don't have the personal learning environment diagram. Oh, well. The idea of the personal learning environment is that we take this kind of connectivist thinking and we implement it as an application. So basically what it is is instead of just me the facilitator of the course having Grasshopper. Everybody in the course has their own version of Grasshopper. So everybody in the course can do their own aggregation, can get their own content in, has their, have their own editing area, and feed their own content forward in their own newsletters or their own RSS feeds. Plus, Plurn addresses a number of the issues that I've run into over the years with RSS aggregators. And the big issue I've run into with RSS aggregators is this. If it's on the desktop, you have a different version every computer you use. And most people over their lifetime will use more than one computer because, well, computers are like that. But if it's on the server, it runs too slowly. Now, Google Reader is pretty good, but Google Reader has an upper limit. And, you know, if you run Google Reader with too much content, too many feeds, you know, or too slow an internet connection, it begins to suffer, shall we say. So, and it won't run at all, really, on my BlackBerry, because my BlackBerry has connectivity issues, it being connected with the phone company, which anyhow, won't do it. So, I want a system that isn't an application, but a set of applications that talk to each other and exchange content back and forth. Kind of like those people. <laughs> They're kind of like a personal learning network, aren't they? Yeah, okay. Sometimes you can work with the analogy, and well, sometimes you can't. So I want basically a distributed set of applications that talk to each other. The other problem, too, that this addresses, and this is a really big problem, and it's something that people are only now really coming to grips with is data mobility. Uh, people spent a lot of time doing things like building, oh, I don't know, uh, uh, live journal blogs or Ning networks or even Facebook profiles and then things change, right? And one company gets sold to another company or company decides that this free thing that it was offering for the last few years it's now going to charge money for and you want all your data and you can't and or you decide you just don't want people to see your data anymore and you can't what i want is a mechanism whereby you are clearly in control and in ownership of your own data even if your data is being stored by some third party and the way you do that is you make sure that you have more than one copy of your data in different places and that you can move that copy back and forth. So here, copy on the server, copy on the desktop. If the people on the server decide that they want to charge you $50 a month, you just wave to them. You don't even need to do anything. You just change the URL in your server account and go somewhere else where it's free. 
And so they can't lock you into their service by holding your data hostage. So it's important that we develop a system with this capacity. As an aside, this is true with learning management systems as well. And it's something I think that the whole learning management system industry has not addressed very well, is this whole idea of portability of data. Those of you who work with WebCT will certainly know what I mean. Those of you who have had to migrate from WebCT to either Blackboard or D2L or wherever certainly know what I mean. It's not a straightforward process. But it should be. It's your data. The functionality of a personal learning environment, some knowing smiles, uh, basically, there are basically six major elements. Most of these are already in Grasshopper, but there's a few that are not. The, the profiler, that's just, you know, who you are, who you know, things like that. Second thing is the aggregator, uses RSS, which is a content syndication format. Basically, it's a way of automating your, your contact network to bring content to you, to have your computer do the bringing of the content to you. All automated. I love it. The third part is the editor. Editor's kind of neat. In Plurn, the editor is a basic editor. I'm not going to try to do anything really fancy with the editor. And the reason for that is the next thing, which is scaffolds. Now, what the scaffolds are really are editors with an attitude. What a scaffold is, is a way of combining learning with the content. The scaffold is a way of taking the same content and looking at it different ways. Take the same content and you look at it one, one way, it's a calendar of events. You look at it another way, it's a list of tasks. Uh, you look at it another way, oh, I don't know, it's a baseball game, whatever. Uh, okay, you can't put the analogy that way. Okay. Uh, but you know what I mean? Um, think of different ways of presenting how to write a letter to your grandma. Uh, you could just present a plain text editor and that would work, or you could set up uh, you know, a little set of forms and you fill in the little forms, dear, space, grandma, you type up grandma, just in case you have your special name, like Nana or whatever, right? Uh, and then, you know, this is for a little kid, right? Today I, space, right? And then you fill out what you did in the day. Last week I got a, and then you leave, I mean, you know what I mean, right? Or you could have a little wizard that will step you through the creation of your letter to grandma, or, well, you can imagine all of the different possibilities where you can have the same content but a different editor, a different interface overlaying it. That's what a scaffold is. What's neat about a scaffold, and the reason why the diagram looks like this is, it doesn't need to just be a form. It can also be an interface to a third-party service on the Internet. And so... A big part of the personal learning environment is the way it connects to these third-party services. There are all kinds of third-party services that have their own API, their own way for our system to connect to their system. Uh, some of them are, are pretty basic, straightforward. Uh, content storage uh, locations like Amazon Web Services or uh, Internet Archive or even things like Twitter. Twitter is nothing but with try that again. Twitter is nothing but a content storage system with a pretty good distribution network. That's what it is. It does it stores many little bits of content. That's what it does. But you know, there there are other more advanced online services that your personal learning environment can connect to. For example, synchronous uh, online conferencing such as Illuminate or Ustream or whatever have an interface which is your scaffold that takes your content and helps you connect with that content to an online conference like Illuminate or Ustream or whatever. That kind of thing. So that your personal learning environment, really importantly, doesn't just stand alone. You know, personal learning is not solo learning. Personal learning is not learning all by yourself. Personal learning is learning in your own way, but connected with other people, just like 
here we pull the analogy in, right? Just like neurons in a network. Just like the connectivist systems that form artificial intelligence beyond traditional AI. Okay, that was jumping about eight different steps in one sentence, I'm sorry. But anyhow, you get the idea. And then finally, we've got all of these different things connected to each other, and then in the center of that, we have a piece of software that connects to all of these different things, almost like a spider in the center of a web, and is able to look at all those different connections do some analysis of these connections and make recommendations to you. And not just recommendations of content. I mean, that's been done. We don't need to do that again, right? There are lots of content recommenders out there. But recommenders of people to talk to, recommenders of online mentors that you might communicate with, recommenders of symposia and seminars that are happening online, recommenders for different kinds of scaffolds that you might use and so on. All kinds of recommending. Any kind of activity you can think of can be recommended by something that's connected to all of these different parts. So that's what we're trying to build. And uh, and I just got the signal that I will not be able to do the canned portion of the talk. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> but that's okay. It's There are versions of it out there already. So. Uh, so basically, the way this works is we set up, you know, you, your individual PLE on the desktop, PLE on the web, various registries that might do DDRM or other such things, other people who are out there, P2P services, all of these things connected in the big network. And the way people learn in this kind of situation, in this kind of environment, is very different from the way people learn in a classroom. In a classroom, it's all about the content. But here, it's all about the practice. It's all about doing the simple things, back to my theme, right? Doing the simple things and doing them over and over and over again and getting really good at them. So here's an early implementation of Learn. We don't promise it will look anything like this later. OK, so what are these practices? Well, we're testing some of the theories that we've come up with so far, because we've learned we really ought to do that, because you can't theorize. I'm a philosopher by profession, so actually I could go my entire career and do nothing but theorize, and I would actually get paid for that. But it's more interesting if you test things, because it's kind of like putting constraints on the theorizing. Anyhow, so we're launching, as I said, today, today, uh, a critical literacies course, a very short course, it's only a six week course, in the connectivist mode. And what's different about the critical literacies course is it's about a subject that isn't the course itself. It's about uh, critical literacies. By critical literacies, I mean the, the underlying principles of cognition. How to learn, how to reason, how to infer, how to create, those sorts of things. So we just rolled out the first post, the first page of the course today. And the first page of the course talks about how you learn in this kind of course. And there are four things. Fingers right. I actually have done that. There are four things. In all seriousness. And they're simple things. They are like batting a ball, throwing a baseball, throwing a bat. Four things. Aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. I don't even have slides for this because I didn't think I'd say this, but anyhow. Aggregate. <coughs> Very simple, right? Pull stuff to you. Pull stuff, even more stuff than you think you could possibly need to you. That's what my aggregator does. 
That's what Grasshopper does. That's what my Google Reader does. That's what my email client does. That's what my telephone does. It, it brings content I don't want a lot of the time. That's what my postal service does. It brings a lot of content I don't want, right? Bringing content in, setting up yourself in the center of a network where you're bringing stuff in. That's all aggregation is. And there are methods and techniques and tactics you can use to get this content to you, but basically it involves bringing it in. Second step, remix. It's, you can't just bring the content in, look at it, and say you've learned. Learning doesn't work that way. If it did, we'd all be geniuses, because we'd just go read every book in the library. It'd be wonderful. It'd take a while, but, but then we'd be geniuses. It'd be worth it, right? But it doesn't work that way. So the first thing that you need to do is once the content comes in, is to put it somewhere, to, to remix it. By that, in, in the critical literacies course, I mean something very simple. Uh, you read a piece of content or watch a video or something, write a short post or make a Twitter comment or add an entry into Delicious or any of these things. Just record that bit of content somewhere and try to record maybe a little bit of information about it. In my own practice, for me, what has worked has been the little hundred word essay that I've written 17,000 of. So record it somewhere. And record it in a place where it's in relation to other things you've read. That's the remix part, right? So in your delicious account, you might have something from I don't know, um, Malcolm Gladwell, something from Mark Pledsky, something from James Paul G, maybe even something from me, who knows. Uh, but there are all these, this content, all these videos or whatever, they're in the same place, they're sort of mixed together and they become almost like your own personal library, except it's online and it doesn't get covered with dust. Which is good for me because that always makes me sneeze. Dust, I mean, not libraries. All right, I don't have a slide. The next step, is repurposing. And what you're doing here is you are working with the content. Uh, you're not just aggregating it, you're not just describing it, but now you're actually applying some level of critical thinking or reflection or creativity to it. And in the critical literacies course, I describe that with a set of simple tools this is beyond the topic of this course, but the simple tools, argument, explanation, description, definition. All the cognition you do, all the thinking you do, all the reflection that you do falls into one of those four categories. So four simple tools for repurposing your content. Four simple, four simple tools for working with this content and making something of your own out of it. You have to work with the content. You know, it's like learning to play darts. Right? You can't learn to play darts simply by watching other people play darts. You can't learn to play darts simply by buying darts, although many people have tried. You have to actually throw the dart. It's like baseball. You actually have to throw the bait. Never mind. I only have five minutes. So you actually have to work with this stuff. And then finally, the fourth step, feed forward. And all that means is publishing your stuff somewhere, anywhere. We don't care where. We'll find it. It's okay. Just any publishing forum that's convenient, publish it. Twitter, Blogger, YouTube, Flickr, Delicious, Facebook, who cares? It doesn't matter. Whatever you're comfortable with, right? The idea is to get the content out there somewhere. Two reasons. Number one. As anyone who has played any sport knows, if you're playing in a game, it's different than if you're just practicing. You gotta practice, but you need the game experience. Publishing is game experience. Publishing gets you motivated. Publishing gets you to pay attention to what you're doing. You're not just going through the motions, you're actually thinking about it and trying to be successful. Second reason, 
when you publish, when you post your critical reflections online, you are creating learning resources for other people. Because the way people learn in this system is they aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. Recursive, right? Well, what are you aggregating? Stuff that other people have published. You learn by working with this material the way other people have worked with this material. And so when you publish, you are creating learning for someone else. Again, it's like baseball, it's like darts, it's like anything. When you do what you're doing in a public space, like I'm doing here with my YouTube broadcast even, or this talk or whatever, you are creating a learning resource for somebody else to look at, observe, and try later on to emulate. Or if you've done it unsuccessfully, and I've done that too, to avoid emulating. So. You're not just learning, you're also passing on the learning to the next cycle. And success in a connectivist course is the next cycle. The same people come back the following year and they start passing on the stuff that they learned the previous year. So this is basically our course structure, a very short six week course, cognition, change, pragmatic, syntax, context, semantics, Boy, that's going to be fun. Uh, yeah. So, the course, no curriculum to remember, no place to go. You just look at the material in the course, pick the stuff that's interesting, aggregate it, remix it, repurpose it, feed it forward. And I think I'll stop there because this is basically the unplanned portion of the talk. The planned portion follows. And uh, you, you can see the slides. These slides, that video, presuming it worked, and the audio recording, which I'm pretty sure worked, I've had very good success with Audacity, which is what I use, uh, will all be available on my website, downs.ca, downs with an E. Uh, otherwise, you'll get Scott Downs, or actually, I don't know who you'll get, but it's not me. I've never looked it up. I should look it up. Anyhow, never mind. Downs.ca, uh, and so this material will be available, and you can see the slides from the prepared part of the talk, which I actually never did. So, <laughs> we. See how important the content is? <laughs> so there we go. So thank you very much. Okay, in a nutshell. <laughs> it's a, that, that, the OERB, publish. <laughs> Send your stuff to all your teachers to share their stuff. It's amazing, I think, that uh, to see the kind of thinking that goes on to help us move forward in, in online education and the kinds of things that are going to happen in any education and how the internet and how all the co the connections between people and our being responsible for our own learning really is going to change the face of education in the future. It may take a little while, but boy, the people out there thinking about it are really pushing the envelope for us. So I'd like to say thank you very much. And you're yes. making faces at me. I know you were. No. <laughs> Just mouthing words. <laughs> and thank you very much for your time. Glad to have you here today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Oh, I'm just here in case there's questions or yeah. you can feel free to leave now. It's okay. You can go. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna eat his dinner here. So he has steak and he has like three chicken kebabs. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So I'm going to turn off the audio. So those of you who are online, thanks everyone. And uh, so I'm going to stop broadcasting, stop recording. See you later.